in a 20-9 lead at half. Schaefer and Kearney again connect in the third quarter. With a score 23-12 and just under nine minutes remaining in the period, Pete engineers a 70-yard, 15-play drive. The Trojans use 11 minutes and 8 seconds to make it 30-12. Then, a harbinger of 1987 electrifies the Irish faithful in the Coliseum. Tim Brown returns Schaefer's kickoff 57 yards into USC territory. Burline connects with Banks out of the backfield for a 22-yard touchdown. Lou Holtz decides to go for the two-point conversion, and the Irish get it as Burline finds Milt Jackson for the deuce. It's now a 10-point game, 30-20 USC. But in the first series of the fourth quarter, Pete caps another Trojan scoring march by sneaking over from the one. With just over 12 minutes remaining in the game, Notre Dame trails by 17. Burline, though, takes only three plays before he finds Jackson in the corner of the end zone for a 42-yard strike. Jackson makes a beautiful catch for the score. After a penalty for illegal motion, Carney connects on the PAT, 37-27 Trojans. Pete bleeds the clock and the yardage as he takes his team deep into Irish territory. On fourth and goal from the five, Pete tries to sneak for a first down, which would make it goal to goal and doom Notre Dame. But Pete is stopped. A flag is thrown for unsportsmanlike conduct, and on the field where questionable calls have plagued the Irish for years, USC now knows the feeling. From his own 25, Burline connects with Brown for 49 yards to the USC 26-yard line. Eventually, Bank scores around the left end, and Burline finds Heck for the conversion. After trailing by 17 points to begin the quarter, Notre Dame now trails by two. Tim Brown makes the catch of the kick at the Notre Dame 28. The 1987 Heisman Trophy winner then serpentines his way through the SC punt team until Spurls finally makes the tackle. The ball ends up at the Trojan 16. Two minutes, 15 seconds remain on the Coliseum clock. The Irish inch down to the six, then to the two. Two seconds remain as John Carney is called on for victory or a head-shaking loss. Carney missed against Michigan, Pittsburgh, and LSU earlier in the season in key situations. The man who eventually will become one of pro football's best place kickers rips it through the uprights for a 38-37 Notre Dame victory. It was later learned by those in the Coliseum that they were the only ones to actually see the kick as it occurred. CBS did not return to the game action from its commercial break in time to see the actual game winner. When one thinks of Notre Dame's traditional rivals in football, schools that immediately come to mind, Army, Navy, Purdue, Michigan State, Michigan, and of course USC. But from 1981 through 1992, there was another university added to the list of big time rivals for the Irish. Penn State and Notre Dame are similar in several ways. Both recruit in similar regions of the country, both have large and extremely loyal followings of fans, and both are renowned for hard-nosed, smash-mouth power football. And no game better exemplified and symbolized the schools than the contest of November 14, 1992. After a tie versus Michigan and a loss to Stanford, Notre Dame successfully regroups and is on a roll. Final game of the 92 season will have everything befitting an old-time gridiron classic, including weather that will span the spectrum of every conceivable condition. Weather in South Bend turns unpredictable and oftentimes unforgiving as fall becomes winter, and that was never more apparent as Irish seniors run out of the tunnel for the final time.
Notre Dame lost the previous two games to Joe Paterno's squad, and the Irish come out pumped. The Craig Hendrick field goal gives Notre Dame the lead. The game moves through the first quarter, and the snow begins to fall. Harder and harder. The turf becomes slippery, visibility falls, and fans huddle for one. The Nittany Lions respond after the Irish field goal as Tyson Thomas hauls in a 46-yard pass from Kerry Collins. Five plays later, Richie Anderson dives in for the score. On the extra point attempt, Irish freshman Bobby Taylor leaps to block the kick. You in the stadium realize just how important this play will be as the afternoon moves toward evening. The second quarter becomes a battle of trench warfare as Notre Dame Stadium is covered with a white quilt of snow. Penn State linebacker Brian Gelsheiser, in a reserve role, will play maybe the game of his life. Gelsheiser nearly intercepts Rick Meyer, but freshman wide receiver Derek Mays wrestles the ball away for a 12-yard gain. The slow-moving drive ends on another Hendrick field goal as the first half ends 6-6. On the second possession of the third quarter, Meyer mixes passes and runs to get the Irish into field goal range. Hendrick is true on his third of the game from 37 yards out. It's 9-6 Notre Dame after three quarters. As the final quarter wanes, Penn State moves the ball. It's goal to goal when the Irish defense rises. Richie Anderson is stopped point blank, and Joe Paterno wisely goes for the three points. It's back to square one as the field goal is good, the game is tied at nine. With 4.25 left to play, Penn State scores again. Brian O'Neill bursts 13 yards to make it 16-9. The Nittany Lions defense needs only to hold for one or maybe two possessions, and it will be another win for Penn State at Notre Dame Stadium. No one is more aware of this than Rick Meyer. Will he be remembered as one of the greatest quarterbacks in Irish history, or merely one who came close? The answer comes in a methodical, almost painfully tense drive as the clock, the weather, and the Penn State defense are stacked against the Irish offense. From the Irish 36, Meyer throws to fullback Jerome Bettis, who gets a key block from Todd Norman. Bettis gains 21 to the Penn State 43. Then Meyer hits Ray Grigg for 17 yards to the Penn State 21. Six plays later, the ball rests on the three. 25 seconds remain. It is fourth down. Meyer gets one more shot. He fades and feathers the ball over the middle to Bettis, who takes it in for the touchdown. There is no question as to what comes next. In 1987 at Beaver Stadium, Lou Holtz went for the win against the Nittany Lions, but fell short on the two-point conversion. This day will be different. Meyer drops to pass and looks left. Lake Dawson is open, but only for a moment. Meyer looks again, pumps and lets the ball fly toward the southwest corner of the south end zone. Reggie Brooks extends his 5 feet 8 inch frame to the limit and latches onto the ball. Brooks, a notoriously inconsistent receiver in practice, has made the big play. Meyer and company have come through, but a few more moments of agony remain for Irish fans. A 15-yard penalty call for the crowd spilling onto the field gives Penn State one last shot. But Collins' last pass is incomplete, and the last game of the Notre Dame-Penn State series ends 17-16 Irish.